much for being here with me. Last talk of the day. I feel very honored. I'm also really excited to speak all, to all of you specifically for a few reasons. And first, the woman I just hugged, and I have the honor speaking after. Rachel, um, she's, she's the reason I'm here today, and she's also been one of my biggest supporters since I began my research in this field. So it's a big deal to be here with her today speaking alongside her. She's, like I said, she's my doctor crush. <laughs> um, second, most if not all of you are cannabis experts in this room, yes? Right? Um, and that means, and Rachel had you raise your hands, you all have a pretty good understanding of the endocannabinoid system, which I'll also refer to as the ECS as we go through this. So I get to preach to the choir today. I don't always get to do that. That's really exciting and I love it. It also means I get to dive right into sharing what I've spent most of my lifetime studying and practicing that complements and hopefully enhances the knowledge you guys already have and the work you guys are all doing. I believe recent discoveries around cannabis and the ECS are leading modern medical science to proving the foundational theories of the most ancient modern science, medical sciences. Getting everyone in the cannabis industries to integrate this wisdom into every aspect of your businesses, I believe is critical at this time in the evolution of science and medicine. And that's why I love working with growers, dispensary workers, educators, researchers, healthcare practitioners, and all of your customers and patients. That's my life's work now for the most part. Together, we're the pioneers, the boundary pushers, and the ones who are setting the stage for the future of cannabis use, science, education, and healthcare. So my goal as an integrative healthcare practitioner and educator is to support all of you to have the most satisfied customers on every level. And for me, that means physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Um, when we tap into all of these levels of someone, that's truly where the most profound experiences occur. And all of you have key roles in this regard right now in history to help integrate the best of ancient and modern medical sciences. How we manage this moment in history with integrating cannabis and the care of the endocannabinoid system into healthcare, education, and retail systems is going to impact your well-being and the health of our future generations and the health of this entire planet. I want you to leave here today to help me spread awareness of this powerful aspect of our physiology in a new way with the ancient sciences I'm going to talk to you about. It's more important than ever to promote the use of herbs and classical natural medicine practices combined with the modern research practices and products. So most of you know the basics about the system. Is anybody in here not familiar with the endocannabinoid system? I'm not going to spend a lot of time in that, which I usually do, but I want to at least give a basic definition, which Rachel helped me out with. Here's one version of defining the endocannabinoid system is hard, by the way, and I don't like 90% of the definitions that are out there. So this one comes close to me, and I think really parallels what Dr. Knox was just telling you about. I like to say that the ECX acts like a motherboard, networking and regulating our other systems. It has the objective of creating homeostasis, as Dr. Knox said, and that's homeostasis within all of the body's major systems. And I believe it could be considered the most important physiological system involved in establishing and maintaining health in human beings. And it's been around for a really long time. <laughs> this is a sea squirt. Anybody ever seen a sea squirt before? <laughs> I haven't either until so I started studying the endocannabinoid system. It has, it's an invertebrate marine mammal and it's been around for over 600 million years. And it's actually the most primitive animal that they've found cannabinoid receptors in. So this means that the endocannabinoid system has existed for 600 million years. And when did we discover it? What, right? 1990s. So it's been found actually in most vertebrates and invertebrates. The only species that they haven't found an ECS in are insects. I just think it's pretty interesting. They have a lot of levels. So, all of these cuties have an endocannabinoid system. Someone told me I needed babies and puppies. Um, so I want to make a few points right now while you look at these cute animals. This system has been 
around and self-regulating animals for a very long time, 600 million years as a matter of fact, right? And other than a few select species, very few of them have been using cannabis to self-regulate this system. I mean, the baby duck's not using cannabis. <laughs> so, how and why are humans unique in regards to our use of cannabinoids? I mean, it's an interesting question, and we know we've been using cannabis and cannabinoids for a long time. One theory is that when humans move to an agricultural lifestyle versus a hunter-gatherer lifestyle, our endocannabinoid system seems to have evolved to interact with a more diverse dietary stimuli and lifestyles that have become less and less connected to living in balance with nature. Most of our foods, and for sure cannabis, have become cultivated and are substantially different than their wild ancestor plants. Same with the animals we eat. Additionally, our lifestyles no longer center around the seasons or daylight hours. These factors seem to have many implications for how we modulate our endocannabinoid systems differently than most other animals. And with this said, Chinese medicine, my area of expertise, has been diagnosing and treating conditions in humans for thousands of years that are now being connected to the endocannabinoid system. And we've been doing this both with and without cannabis. And it's very, very important to understand this, this system in regards to and regardless of cannabis, especially when we decide how we're going to use cannabis. This group probably knows as much or more about the socio-political history of cannabis as I do, so I'm not gonna go into detail about that either. But I will say that cannabis got lost from Chinese medical lineages for the same reasons and along the same timeline as it did here in the West. We all grew up in the era of cannabis censorship and negative stigma, yet everybody in this room and many of us found our way to working with this herb. My practices in yoga and Chinese medicine took on an entirely new dimension when I was finally able to connect my studies and experiences with cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. And then I went down amazing rabbit holes when I connected them to yoga and Chinese medicine. Um, and this is why I went to a naturopathic medical school to do my doctoral degree in Chinese medicine in a state where cannabis was legal. But even here, I was one of the only people talking about the endocannabinoid system. I mean, I had to pull Dr. Knox in to get support at my school because my teachers did not even know what the endocannabinoid system was. And most of my teachers were less than enthused to support my work as soon as the word cannabis was mentioned, right? So cannabis is still not allowed to be researched at federally funded institutions, you all know that. And even if you have a medical card, and serious medical conditions, students in medical schools aren't allowed to use cannabis. We are still dealing with the stigma and misinformation around this herb. You all certainly know that. But even more shocking to me was that no one at my school felt that the endocannabinoid system was a significant physiological system to study and teach. <laughs> For us now who know about this system and to realize this was shocking to me. But in defense of my teachers, they weren't taught about the system, so how could I expect them to teach the system? And I do want to give a few of my teachers credit. By the, by the end of my time at my medical school, a few were incorporating my work into their curriculums. And literally my work, a newbie in the field, was some of their best resources when they went out to try and find work to share with their students. Um, so I give a few props to them, especially my immunology professor. She was my biggest cheerleader at my school because the light bulbs went on for her when she started reading my work. I was excited to see, yet we have a long way to go. Studies have recently shown that the majority of medical schools are still not teaching about cannabis at all, and the ECS has yet to earn its rightful place in most anatomy and physiology curriculums. This is changing thanks to a lot of you guys. And every year there are more of us in our various science fields now focusing on increasing awareness and educating about the relevant correlations found and now being attributed um, to the endocannabinoid system and correlating them to different substances and practices that we use. However, I believe it's very important for our, our conversations 
Oh, okay. So it's happening, and most of these conversations are still happening around cannabis. I wrote my doctoral thesis on the endocannabinoid system from classic kind of medical per uh, perspective, but everybody said I was writing my paper about cannabis. And that's fine, and there's reasons why we're still, we, me, I, I mean, we're still hyper-focused on cannabis. But I believe all of us have a responsibility now to make sure every conversation we have goes beyond cannabis, especially when we're talking about cannabis. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. So this is ultimately going to provide more, not less, support for cannabis to be brought back into its superior status in our systems, which it held for thousands of years. Various varieties of cannabis, both with and without THC, have been used for millennia, not just as food and medicine, but also for spiritual practices. And we have a lot of evidence for all of this in Chinese medicine. This timeline notes a few of the major indications of this. With THC, it's been used in many cultures to provide deepened states of meditation, heightened awareness, and to drive away evil spirits. So the tomb that you see up here, there's a little red thing, that's, that is a 1,300-year-old shaman's tomb that was found recently with the world's oldest stash of high THC cannabis. Okay, so that's... Uh, and and they, they confirmed that this is a shaman's tomb and it was used for spiritual practices. For the most part, this plant has been censored out of Chinese medicine's educational systems, just like it has here in the West. Even though one of our foundational texts, right here, uh, states cannabis's superiority amongst herbal medicines. It's literally called a superior herb. And the, if someone has studied Chinese herbal medicine, this is the foundational text, and it calls cannabis a superior herb, yet they don't teach cannabis as a medicine in Chinese medicine anymore. And I'd like to read you actually a quote from this right now. Many Chinese uh, medical scholars suggest this passage is referring to the use of hemp seeds. But I would like to know what you professional hemp and cannabis growers think when I read this to you. Taking much of it may make one behold ghosts. <laughs> Prolonged taking may enable one to communicate with the spirit light and make the body light. Hemp seeds? Oil. Oil. Right? So don't get me wrong, hemp seeds are really powerful too. They've been used as food and medicine documented for over 10,000 years. This book actually talks very specifically about hemp seeds. It says prolonged taking may make one fat, strong, and never senile. <laughs> like good. that. Right? <laughs> so yay for THC, yay yeah. for hemp seeds, <laughs> yay for hemp, cannabis, whatever. The whole, the whole kit and caboodle's in there. They also talk about, um, we also have a lot of historical evidence that really alludes to confirming that they used low and no THC flower and buds. And all of this basically points to the fact that Chinese medicine has an extremely refined and rich knowledge of how to use the different varieties and parts of this and many plants for specific healing conditions. This wisdom is reflected in ancient Chinese and Ayurvedic herbal formulas. And herbs, by the way, are intentionally prepared in various ways and then prescribed as formulas in our medicine. That's something we'll talk a little bit more about, and often in conjunction with other practices like acupuncture. Like Watteau here was doing in formulas using cannabis to numb patients during surgery. So this is an excerpt from an original copy of an over 400 year old text. And I'll just point out right now, this is the, the Chinese character for cannabis. Depending on what part of the plant, there are other characters added to it. So that's ma, that is the, you can all le ma. learn an important word for your industry, <laughs> ma. And you know how the Chinese have tones, it's ma. So, uh, and, and you'll see it all the way throughout here uh, in various places. So this, this page is talking about a lot of different aspects of the cannabis plant. So this text, among others, validates that all parts of the cannabis plant have been recorded in historical Chinese medical texts, including the seed, flower or bud, the leaf, the root, 
They also used the uh, cortex of the stalk and even the water used to process the stalk into fiber. All of this are in our Chinese medical text. Formulas, in including many of these parts of the cannabis plant, were usually prescribed, like I said, in conjunction with other herbs and formulas and other practices. And I really want to keep emphasizing this because it's so key and be being validated with our new understandings of physiology thanks to the discovery of the endocannabinoid system and studies looking at how to regulate and balance the system. And that's why Dr. Knox was talking to all of you about the things she was, and I was in the background of the chair. <laughs> So there are three main ways to stimulate cannabinoid receptors in general. The first are the exo or phytocannabinoids, phyto meaning plant-based. I know you guys know a lot about this. Cannabis certainly has the most prolific cannabinoid profile. Over 115 phytocannabinoids have been found in various varieties of cannabis. THC and CBD are certainly the most popular these days and for good reasons and the plant is being cultivated for these to be predominant. However, there are many other cannabinoids. Uh, one, BCP. Anybody not know about BCP? Okay, good. Um, is it phytocannabinoid and a terpene that's actually found in many other herbs? And I've included the Chinese name here as well, just to let you know that when we combine cannabis, or you know, even though it's been censored out of Chinese medicine, a lot of our other herbs and our formulas are either cannabinoids or fall into another category we're going to talk about in a second. So all of these attest to the theories about how the human endocannabinoid system evolved uniquely when we started to become an agrarian species and started consuming plants that more highly stimulated our endocannabinoid receptors differently than other animals. It's so powerful to consider that what we eat and how we live is modulating a system that regulates so much of our functionality. These exogenous forces have such an impact on our endogenous ones. Which brings us to the next category of ECS stimulators, right? Endocannabinoids, internally produced. Dr. Knox talked about these. My favorite is anandamide. I'm biased as a yogi. This is a <laughs> Sanskrit yogic term that means bliss. Research has shown that there are more receptors for anandamide in our brains than for any other substance, which is, I love this, it's mind blowing, <laughs> right? We're literally wired to make and receive bliss. It's beautiful. And it's also a testament to the awareness of the spiritual nature of the system and plan. So I really give props to Ralph Mishulam, who helped discover the endocannabinoid system and actually discovered this molecule in us. He understood the spiritual nature of this aspect of our physiology. So, cannabimimetics are our final category. These are external and internal substances and environmental stimulations combined with our lifestyle practices. Has anybody never heard the word cannabimimetic? All right. It's going to be one of your new favorite words after today. Okay. Cannabimimetics elucidate a holistic approach to the endocannabinoid system. And I believe this is the most powerful, effective way to find balance and experience vitality. So we now know that terpenoids found in cannabis and other plants, such as these, that don't directly bind to the various CB receptors, at least from what we currently know and understand about these receptors, still have a really profound effect on the endocannabinoid system. I'd argue that everything we take into our bodies affects the endocannabinoid system in some way, for better or worse, some more or less. And this system is such a sensitive and all-encompassing aspect of our physiology. And we now know that it's not just substances that affect it. And that brings us to my favorite category of cannabimimetics, lifestyle practices. Combining these things with whatever substances we're using to feel more blissful will, with time and practice, exponentially increase the positive benefits of whatever substances we are using. And I'm just saying in this room, which I don't use to say, this is coming from someone who's used the substance we're all here to talk about since I was too young, right? But what I have learned, both in my personal practices and with my patients, I, I really don't want to understate this. My whole life changed, and I use 
yes, I use way less cannabis now, right? But my experiences are unbelievably, exponentially, extraordinarily better because of all the cannabinoids that I do. So, combining these substances, I think I just said that. I recently had a major surgery. I was giving you an example. So I went into the surgery armed with a lot of cannabimimetic herbs and medicines practices, a healthy diet, and I did not need to take any pharmaceuticals post-op. I actually didn't take any pharmaceuticals pre-op. It stressed my doctors out. And I had, not only did I have less issues than most of their patients, if not all of their patients, I had no issues, I had no symptoms. So, thank you. I actually, uh, I will, I tried one pain med afterwards, mostly as an experience. I actually hated it. Um, and other than that, I really felt amazing and I recovered super quickly. So, I'm really lucky that I got to be here in Oregon where I had the best access to every type of physician. My MDs were amazing, my homeopath, my naturopath, my Chinese medicine docs. Um, uh, as well as access to all the plants and practices. I live in an ashram when I'm here in Portland, so I literally was able to be meditating with master meditators every day through my surgery. But even um, if I was in a state where THC was not legal, and this is really important as well, I wouldn't have been, I mean, I wouldn't have been as happy, <laughs> but I would have been okay because of all these cannabinoid things that I do. We need to remember that we are wired to self-regulate this system. We must cultivate these abilities, right? It's, it's not as easy as going to a dispensary and picking up our herb. Things that I'm talking about take practice. And we've got to take care to not create a dependency on any one tool to balance our endocannabinoid system. So I love this example of a endocannabinoid system regulating tool that we're built with. It's a good one for you to use in conversations to emphasize the primary role of the endocannabinoid system and how it affects our psychological, neurological <coughs> success. Um, I'm sure you all know about the runner's high. Okay, it's a euphoric experience we feel during vigorous exercise associated not only with that feeling of euphoria but reduction in anxiety, a reduction in pain, and an increased sense of relaxation. Sound familiar? <laughs> If you ask most people, they would say, anybody want to take a guess what, what endorphins, Endorphin. right? Maybe adrenaline creates this high. And many in this group likely know about this study. Has anybody heard about the study I'm getting ready to tell you about? No? Okay, this will be fun then. Um, it made it into actually major media quite a few years ago, but it's still one of my favorite examples. This study showed that when the researchers blocked an animal's response to endorphins, the mice were still enjoying that euphoria and that runner's high, but without a working endocannabinoid system, they didn't enjoy that high. So this strongly suggests that endorphins do not create the runner's high, but endocannabinoids do. It also suggests that endocannabinoids, not endorphins or any other substance, play the role in pain relief associated with running, and I would say a lot of other things. So running is cannabimimetic. Studies have shown that other activities and practices are cannabimimetic as well. Of course, I'm a doctor of Chinese medicine, a little biased, but I believe one of the major things that regulates the endocannabinoid system other than herbal therapies is acupuncture. And the studies are starting to come out on this, which is really exciting for me because when I started my research, they did not have any. Recently published studies have presented solid evidence showing that the endocannabinoid system plays a critical role in the effects of acupuncture. The available evidence is mainly focused on analgesia, neuroprotection, and cardiovascular regulation. Acupuncture administration and endocannabinoid system activation produce several of the same identical biological effects, including maintenance of energy balance, the regulation of immune, respiratory, and gastrointestinal functions. There is still much more to explore with the intrinsic links between acupuncture and endocannabinoid system, so I'm a big proponent of that type of research. And um, these kind of understandings are gonna help us increase the clinical efficacy of acupuncture for a myriad of conditions that are now associated with the endocannabinoid system, produce a much stronger therapeutic effect, and a big one is lowering the dosage and side effects of many drugs. And I know that's a little bit 
complicated up here, but we were earlier talking about the upregulation and downregulation, right? So you see all the little arrows with everything. So the endocannabinoid system may be more than any other system alludes <coughs> to the holistic nature of our existence. The endocannabinoid system offers a way to start discussing foundational Eastern concepts and the general idea of holistic functional medicine in terms that Western scholars and physicians can finally understand, especially when they start getting educated on the endocannabinoid system. Like looking at body, mind, and spirit, which can be correlated with what we call in Chinese medicine the three treasures, Jing, Qi, and Shen. And most of you have maybe heard of the word Qi. Long story short, Jing, Qi, qi is what you all have heard of. Jing is the more condensed material aspect of Qi and Shen is the least material aspect of energy or chi. So Jing is bones, hard, dense, even bone marrow. And I could get Dr. Knox to talk to you about the endocannabinoid system and bone marrow and how significant those connections are. But lots of rabbit holes I'll try not to go down today. Anyways, over time, these three treasures, sadly even in my medicine, but especially in Western medicine, got materialized and separated out. And MDs and other physical medicine specialists dealt with the body. Psychologists and psychiatrists with the mind. And spirit got taken out of the medical equation altogether. In classical Chinese medicine, we never separated these things out. And I differentiate now and say classical because I'm kind of like old school Chinese medicine. Okay, even in new school Chinese medicine, they've started having more Western physical based look at how we diagnose and treat. So there are, I'd say less than 10% of Chinese medicine practitioners, practitioners out there are what we call classical, meaning we've studied the most recent research all the way back to the oldest practices. So from our perspective, it's not even possible to separate these things. I would not be a doctor of my medicine if I even attempted to look at things from just a physical or just a mental or just a spiritual perspective. I can't do it. They rewired my body I'm, and my mind and my spirit. <laughs> I can't think of one without thinking of the other two now. They're the three treasures. They go together all the time. So Chinese medicine has been, in my opinion, regulating the endocannabinoid system and all of our systems for a very long time in an unbelievably refined and exquisite way. We use different terminology than it's used now, of course, and not everything has a direct correlation yet. But as modern science is evolving, we see more and more connections all the time. And I had so many lights go on when I started learning about the endocannabinoid system, which they were not teaching me at my medical school, <laughs> when I was studying Chinese medicine. With our deep history of cannabis and other cannabimimetic herbs and practices, I think it's impossible to not draw this bridge and see this connection of how Chinese medicine so beautifully works with the functions and dysfunctions of the endocannabinoid system. And because of all the new science connected to the ECS, combined with these classical, classical concepts that science is now validating, I think all medical lineages have unbelievable opportunities of evolving right now, and that's where integration happens. That's where it, to me, integration is absolutely, no matter what, if you're a retailer, there's ways to integrate this knowledge. If you're an MD, there's ways to integrate this knowledge. As a Chinese medicine practitioner, a lot of teachers didn't want me to study this because they didn't want me talking about Western medical concepts. I'm studying Chinese medicine. Why do you want to talk about this? And I went, because it's better for all of us if we all find the bridges between these things. So that's why I love work, I love working with, I mean, she's my hero, right? And we need her as an MD out there doing this, not just for the MDs, but so the MDs and the Chinese medicine docs start working together. Um, so that's why I love working with everybody from all backgrounds. I really believe that in order to go forward, we all need to look backward and keep what works, right? So speaking of going backwards, let's go backwards 3,500 years. This is a quote from one of the oldest and richest medical texts, period. It is Chinese medical text. And like the ECS, this text alludes to the self-healing potential of our systems. 
It discusses actually the entire text is a conversation between an emperor and a physician. And they're talking about how the sages and the wise people that came before them were able to live over 100 years with ease. So this is 3,500 years ago. And we do have documentation that people were living over 100 years, 3,500 years ago. I'll read this for you. The ancient sages treated all disease through living a peaceful life in balance with nature. They moved and transformed the concentrated qi, the jing qi, without herbs and needles. But humans became internally disturbed by over-attachment to emotions. Sense organs became externally vulnerable by overwork and loss of balance with nature. Our immune systems became weak, and in general, qi was no longer able to flow optimally. Organs, bones, and marrow could become easily damaged, so the old ways no longer worked and herbs and needles became necessary. <coughs> Homeostasis is the primary objective of Chinese medicine. My first day of my first year in Chinese medicine school, I have heard the word homeostasis a hundred thousand times. Where else have you heard the word homeostasis lately? The endocannabinoid system. Jeez. Same primary function, driving an entire medical system that literally defines the endocannabinoid system. The ancient sages knew then how to live a cannabimimetic lifestyle, your new favorite word, and they healed themselves naturally. So I think it's really important for all of us to remember these old ways when we use herbs and needles and drugs and surgery to regain balance with nature and therefore in ourselves. This is a beautiful, beautiful, multi-thousand year old piece of artwork. Can you kind of see the human and nature in the body? And I mean, I had a whole class that was based on this picture, so we're not going to go into it, but literally like the digestive system is explained by how humans worked in relationship to nature, the lung system, all of the different systems were all described with how humans were interacting with nature and then creating this perfect harmony and balance with exogenous and endogenous forces. I just love that photo. So current clinical antidotes, when I read research around the endocannabinoid system and cannabimimetic practices, they suggest things like running and meditation, yoga, deep breathing exercises, only impart a mild cannabimimetic effect. But I argue that. I really truly believe that the only reason they're mild is just because we need to do them more often. Once your endocannabinoid system is appropriately stimulated and we're living a cannabimimetic lifestyle, a cascade of physiological events begins happening every day that helps maintain or when necessary regain a homeostatic state. So do we all need the same things? Is, one, is medicine one size fits all? No, no. You guys know this awareness just from using the different varieties of cannabis for different purposes, much less observing how different inner individuals react differently with the same product, right? Each of you needs to, it, in Chinese medicine, we, uh, let's see, an endocannabinoid, no, the new term is cannabinology, we upregulate and downregulate. In Chinese medicine, we tonify and reduce. So again, the terminology, right? It's identical. And when you look at where we need to tonify in Chinese medicine, guess what you find? Clinical endocannabinoid deficiency. So when I reviewed all my teachers' tar charts for anything that had deficiency and needing tonification and what the symptoms were, and then I went over to cannabinology, I found direct correlations. And the same thing when there were excesses and from a Chinese medical perspective. The, the areas of the body, so we diagnose by different organs and channels and networks. When a certain network was excess and a person had symptoms, the clinical cannabinologist would have said there was an upregulation or an excess. So Chinese medicine has been doing this for a long time. We look at where there's excess and deficiency, and then we figure out how to tonify and or reduce as necessary. Uh, modern medical science is learning to do this in new ways, thanks to the discovery of the endocannabinoid system. But we've only just, again, started to look at things whole, so holistically. 
And that's why I chose to focus on learning to practice and teach from a holistical, functional, medical point of view. And I use Chinese medicine and yoga as my foundational tools. And I think it's beautiful to come at it from an MD's perspective and use those foundational tools. I see results with myself and my patient students when I combine these practices with the newest cannabinoid research all the time. And every other doctor I know who's doing this, regardless of what lineage they're coming from, seem to be discovering the same things. And when we all start working together, that's where I see the really miraculous results. I want to emphasize one more time the key aspect of Chinese herbal medicine, uh, especially to all of you in the cannabis industry, that using multi-herbal formulations is foundational and vital to the successful treatment of our patients. Formulas allow us to address multiple issues at once, just like the other Dr. Knox was saying, someone may come in with Crohn's disease, but I guarantee you there's a long list of other things. That's another really tricky one to pick one cannabis product, right? But when we start formulating and cannabis becomes part of a formula, I can look at all of your issues and come up with protocols. We're able to boost the effectiveness of individual herbs when we know and understand how to combine those herbs. And we're able to counter potential side effects, right, of certain herbs. So we can actually do that even within understanding cannabinoid and terpene ratios within a plant. We talk about the entourage effect within the plant. But for me, as soon as I learned about the word entourage through the cannabis world, my world went into formulas. That's where the real entourage happens, right? When I'm able to not just take each individual plant, but then I figure out how to prepare each plant. I might put fresh ginger, but honey baked, you know, another herb honey baked and another herb boiled together. And they'll be different than if I used three fresh herbs together. And, you know, so understanding how to dose. And this is where I'm actually still extraordinarily humble, national certified board herbalist, but like I bow to the people that have spent their lifetimes understanding herbalism on such a refined level. And now even as a doctor who specializes in that, that's where, that's where it gets really amazing. And it is really important. And I would love to see this approach be taken again with cannabis. That's where it, it began its life in India and China. It was not just prescribed individually, almost ever. It was in a formula with other herbs. So this is going to require, I mean, we've got a long way to go in the cannabis industry, and now I'm asking you guys to help me figure out how to bring this back into uh, herbal medicines and formulation. That's going to mean a lot for not only Chinese medicine scholars, but researchers aren't doing this, you know, the cannabis industry. To some extent, I'm starting to see more of the, like, healthcare beauty products that are combining other herbs. But on a medical level, that's, it's, but it is, that's to me where the game is. For thousands of years, that's how we used it. And, you know, when is that going to start again? And how are we going to get there? Legal policy makers. I'm not legally allowed to even do anything with cannabis, right? I'm not an MD. I have more training with herbs, and I'm from a medical lineage that has 3,000, you know, years with cannabis. And I'm not allowed to talk about it from a diagnostic or treatment perspective yet. So we have a long way to go. Um, but I'm excited about that, and that's why I'm out here doing this, because we're all on that bridge together, right? And there are a lot of things that are exciting to explore with new information with cannabis and the endocannabinoid system. Every network in Chinese medicine, so when I say network, we talk about the heart channel, the kidney channel, the liver channel. Is anybody even a little familiar? Okay, good. Um, all of these, we are taught, are regulated by and literally these are, were the words that they used, an endogenous system that's sensitive to messages from the most subtle to the densest levels of our body. Sounds like the endocannabinoid system to me. Research is now proving this, that the ECS may be a key part of this process. And classical Chinese medicine has the really refined understanding of the functions now attributed to the endocannabinoid system. I really believe that this specifically is because we embrace both the seen and the unseen aspects of our physiology, body, mind, and spirit. So I loved when Dr. Knox put something up that referred to the body as a machine. And it is, by the way. It's also a garden. 
Modern science is referred to as being Western because it's rooted in rational philosophies of European enlightenment. The driving principle behind this is Occam's razor. I don't know if you've all heard of this, but it's the notion that among competing theories, the one with the simplest explanation should be selected. In most modern medicine, this has led to the paradigm of physical reductionism, which reduces medical issues to physical explanations and usually prescribes a purely physical solution. And I think it would be fair to say that Western medicine views often views the human system as a machine. Every time you're si sick, it's simply because one of the body's gears is clogged or some other mechanical malfunction. And this reductionist view of medicine is actually not in itself a bad thing. And its focus on physical specialization is often preferable to alternative treatments in a lot of circumstances, like emergency surgery. I mean, I had a surgery recently, right? I loved my doctor. I needed that surgery. It was the perfect thing in that situation. Holistic medicine, however, evaluates the entire person, physical body, non-physical mind, spirit, and seeks to heal imbalances in between these. It emphasizes the body's own ability to heal itself as well as promoting healthy lifestyle changes and preferably using naturally occurring remedies like meditation and herbal medicines versus synthetically produced compounds. Because it's not redu reductionist in nature, holistic medicine can also be used as a counterpart to modern medicine. And again, like I said, when we integrate these things is really when the best stuff starts happening. The issue that many have with modern medicine these days is that its science and philosophy purposely exclude anything that doesn't fit its reductionist paradigm. It cannot, by its very definition, consider that humans both have a physical and a non-physical essence. The endocannabinoid system, to me, is a barometer for body, mind, and spirit balance. Science is proving that we must acknowledge the less tangible aspects of our physiology. So when people come in to you to talk, say, I have a migraine, there's something other than something physical going on, right? When someone comes in to you saying, I'm really sad, there's also something physical going on. Thankfully, more people than ever are starting, because we're all developing an awareness of this, we're craving an integrated approach to our medicine. We, we're looking, we want to see our MD, but we want, we a lot of times just feel like we're not getting everything from them. We want that other stuff. I mean, and ideally all of us, again, I try and have that holistic approach, but I really do a better job when I have someone who is trained as an MD and someone like me and another person who's been focusing really on the mental, emotional stuff. and When we combine things, I'm trying to do that all within myself. I think of myself now as a physical medicine, a mental and a spiritual medicine specialist. And I want all of us to do that. So that's my, my mission. Body, mind, spirit. Jing, Chi, Shen. You guys have new words. Cannabomimetics is your new favorite word, don't forget. My mission is to reestablish re Chinese medicine's role with cannabis and other cannabomimetic herbs in medicine. Show how Chinese medicine and yoga address pathologies now being attributed to the endocannabinoid system. I want to show the necessity of integrating body, mind, and spirit into all medical sciences. And I want to show an awareness that being connected to nature's rhythms is so critical for our health and the future health of all life on this planet. For decades now, Few of us knew the wisdom of ancient Chinese medicine. It was lost, and it has been found, and is starting to be unearthed. And none of us knew about the endocannabinoid system. Today, we can see strong connections between these times and systems that can radically improve health care for every single patient and every single practitioner in the world. And that's why I'm here with you now. That's why all the doctors that came here today are with you guys. And I hope you will join us in integrating these ancient and modern sciences into your daily lives and into the lives and the educational systems and healthcare systems and your business systems and with your customers. I like to say you guys are the bridge builders. You're the leaders of the cannabimimetic evolution and revolution. Integrators of body, mind, and spirit to maximize healing potential. It's really, you guys are the, on the front lines. And that's a big deal. 
and I want to hope that you please remember that getting everyone in the cannabis industries to integrate this wisdom into every aspect of your professions is critical at this time in the evolution of science and medicine and wherever cannabis is going as a plant, as a plant on this planet. And right now the pharmaceuticalization is happening and if we all don't really advocate not just for this plant but for these old ways, we lose. The whole world loses. It's our job. Yeah, exactly. So please, I'll have cards here. Please take them. See my website. I'm working on books. I'm working on courses for cannabis dispensaries and for both conventional medical schools and uh, integrative medical schools. And I, I have a few copies of my doctoral capstone. It's really Chinese medicine-y. Uh, Dr. Knox actually was one of the readers of my project. She took it to an amazing higher level than it would have been without her. So I still thank you for this. And now we're going to get some extra mileage out of that work that she did. Um, I completed my doctoral degree a couple years ago, and my book's not out. So I decided to give you guys a copy of this because it's really at the foundation of all the work I'm, I'm doing now. And all of my work that I do is um, in support of scholars. I mean, I want all of you to be scholars. I want all of us to learn and study, which is why you're all here today and you stayed to the end. Thank you. <laughs> because deep down, we are all scholars. And I'm specifically directing the only scholarship foundation in the country that's a nonprofit organization that supports people who are studying acupuncture and oriental medicine. So anybody that wants to throw any dollars at that, you can have a copy of my doctoral thesis. That's <laughs> Hardly a sale. You'll probably give me less money than it cost me to print them, but that's fine. <laughs> um, and however you want to help support my mission, I really encourage you to, to call me. I'm, I, right now, that's my job. Like, how can I work with other people to help you do what you're doing and help me do what I'm doing? Um, so, thank you for taking this journey with me. I'm looking forward to connecting with everyone in this room in different ways. I hope you all reach out, and I'll leave you with one last piece of advice. Embracing this is very important. Not just body, mind, Spirit, but there is one substance in practice that I believe we all need to remember. Love. It is the most cannabimimetic medicine of all. So, for instance, I know a lot of people that say use cannabis because they have depression, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll smoke it and they don't do the cannabis. Cannabimimetic. I'm going to go home. We're all helping each other. <laughs> it's going to be your new favorite word. So they won't integrate with other activities, and they think just the cannabis alone will help. But then, ironically, that makes them maybe socially anxious or something. So then there's this feedback loop of their motivation is inherently really low. So what's something you would suggest for people who are caught in that kind of cycle? Well, it's a great question, and it's, it's one that a lot of... One of my favorite ways to answer a lot of questions, and if you guys ever had me as a teacher, you'll start getting this and then going, how do I ask this question so she doesn't answer like this? <laughs> For whom and when? Every person is individual. And when you see this same similar pattern in people, then you, there is something in general I can say, which is how do we educate people to understand that you have to develop these endogenous mechanisms in our body. If you don't exercise a muscle, that muscle's not going to work. And cannabis can help tonify the parts of our system. So I'm not saying it can't help tonify you know, these, these muscles, these mechanisms in us to help us alleviate depression, for example. <coughs> if we only rely on that one thing, even if it does, maybe they start using it and for a few weeks or for a few months it works great. But then, geez, it doesn't, it doesn't work long time. Or now all of a sudden, okay, it helped me with this thing, but now I've got this other thing because now I'm using this thing all the time and it has other side effects. So, I mean, it, you know, I know you guys can't be doctors and diagnosers and treaters, but you can talk common sense to people, you know, and you've already got it. I mean, you can answer your question, right? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> you really can. You, I mean, you're the ex you are that expert. Like the fact that you have this question, that you're seeing that observation, you actually know, absolutely know the answer for these people. And that's where the for whom and when comes in. And that's the, that to me is part of the art of medicine. Is I, I need to know who I'm talking to and I need to talk to them in a way that they're going to hear me. And each person that 
comes to you and you see this pattern with how do you get that, that message that you actually already know across to that person so they hear it? I mean, I wish I had a magic answer. Just tell them this and they'll change their patterns at least. But we grew up in the West. We grew up where we want a single solution. We want you to hand us a pill. We want to drive through and get a bag and go eat. That's how our minds, that's how we've been raised. And it doesn't work. We know that now, across the board. It just doesn't work. And so we need to educate people on that. We need more than one tool. One tool will always maybe help, but it'll be temporary until we get the whole tube up on. Right? So fascinating. So the real question I had was in terms of when you said they're not teaching in Chinese medicine anymore. When did that, was that the last 100 years? Yeah, so, so 100 years of prohibition. It's, yeah, it's even, I mean, the Chinese masters that I got to study with were still afraid to talk about this stuff. Are you talking in China or here? Here. Yeah, here in they the U.S. They had U.S. citizenship. Yes. They were teaching at U.S. schools, and they still were right. afraid to talk about how and when things changed over there. Right. And it was illegal. I mean, doctors were killed if they did not convert from the old medical ways to the new medical ways. Oh. Right? I mean, everything from archaeology to medicine was censored. Granted, communism was about simplifying and making things accessible to the people, so it wasn't all bad, but we lost a lot of the arts, right? And that's when cannabis also changed during that same era because China was trying to westernize and modernize. Right. And yeah, that's when it got lost. So we have thousands of years of texts proving that it was there, and yet still my teacher said, no, it's just all hemp seeds. That's just fear of stigma. Basically, like, yeah. No. Fear of stigma is driving all this because it's like, take your license away, put you in jail, kill you, whatever. And that's socially acceptable in the West because, right. you know, it's not anymore, but it's changing. But, yeah, yeah, there is even more fear still there. And yet, China and the U.S. hold more patents on cannabis parts than any other mm -hmm. individuals or corporations in the world. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, just as an aside, in China there's five you just came back. Just came back. They have there's five legal cultivators of hemp. They can only export. Wow. Hemp. Wow. Right. And yet they hold more patents <laughs> on <laughs> cannabis plants and have Right, it's I mean, it's ironic. Those all got filed by Chinese government and US government officials on the same years they made it illegal in our countries. I've always heard part of the reason that it's all export is because they use it as a bioaccumulator and it's dirty and it's uh -huh. just full of heavy metals and all sorts of other gross stuff. Yeah. Who knows what they're dead? Any other questions? <laughs> okay you guys, please get in touch anytime. It's been really great talking with you.